I, I had a, an ambassador say, well, you know, this was uh, uh, the people of Myanmar were not invaded by a foreign country. But the fact is, those distinctions are lost on the people of Myanmar. This junta um, is acts as one of the largest militaries in the region and acts precisely as a foreign military power uh, that is uh, uh, wreaking havoc uh, across the country. They are deeply unpopular throughout Myanmar. They are uh, responsible for horrific crimes against humanity and war crimes. And so the distinction between those who are being assaulted by forces that have gone into their country versus those who are being assaulted by forces that originated from their country is lost on those people. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program. As you may know, World Boston's mission is to foster engagement international in international affairs and global cooperation. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and doing this mission with us. Please do learn more about World Boston at worldboston.org. And if you can, support us financially. You can always donate at worldboston.org. So very fortunately, uh, to discuss this complex and evolving topic, uh, we're very honored to host tonight's speaker, Tom Andrews, who is UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, a uh, former congressman from Maine. Uh, Tom is the Robina Senior Human Rights Fellow at Yale University Law School. He's an associate of Harvard's Asia Center and has a Washington, D.C.-based consulting practice, Andrews Strategic Services. He's worked with the National Democratic Institute uh, for International Affairs and parliamentarians, NGOs, and uh, political parties in several countries, including Cambodia, Indonesia, Algeria, Croatia, Serbia, Ukraine, and Yemen. It's quite a spread. So Tom served as General Secretary of the Nobel Peace Laureate Campaign for Aung San Suu Kyi and the people of Burma in 2001, and was consultant for the National Coalition Government of the Union of Burma and the Euro uh, Burma Network. He has run advocacy NGOs, including Win Without War and United to End Genocide. He led an education institute at the University of Maine and served in the Maine House of Representatives and the Maine Senate. He lives with his wife and son in Fairfax, Virginia, outside of Washington, DC. Okay, so finally, Tom, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight's dis uh, discussion, and I'm happy to hand it over to you. Well, Mary, thank you very, very much for your introduction, and thank you to uh, World Boston for the opportunity to, to join you this evening and for focusing on an issue uh, that has really not received the attention that I believe uh, it deserves, the deepening crisis in Myanmar. My only regret tonight is that I am not joining you in Boston this evening. I grew up uh, in the Boston area, in, uh, in Northeastern, uh, where my interest in, in world affairs and advocacy and, and organizing began. I uh, and some friends of mine in high school started a youth organization. We uh, raised money and engaged in projects uh, both locally and, uh, and around the world. And it was through that experience that I uh, was hooked as an advocate and an organizer and started off on a journey that continues uh, to this day. So it's particularly nice to be with you, even though uh, I'm with you uh, virtually. Um, I feel like I'm a local. Um, it's uh, it, some of us, uh, <laughs> I must say, are probably still a little bit groggy uh, after a very light, uh, late night and early, uh, early morning awaiting the election returns. Uh, and there was, of course, history made uh, in Massachusetts yesterday when uh, Governor-elect uh, Maura Healey uh, became the first woman and gay person to be elected governor of the Bay State. And I just want to say congratulations to her and to uh, the people of Massachusetts. It was uh, an election uh, some years ago that first drew my attention to Myanmar, <clears throat> two elections actually. I was first elected to represent Maine's first congressional district in the US Congress in 1990. And that was the same year that Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy won an overwhelming victory over the military-linked political party in Myanmar. The military junta agreed to have an election 
after massive national demonstrations convulsed Myanmar in 1988. They were convinced that they would win a decisive victory. And when they lost that ele election decisively, they declared the election null and void. Aung San Suu Kyi and many of her colleagues went into detention or into exile, and I was able uh, to go to Congress. That got my attention, and, and quite frankly, that really, uh, that really angered me. I ended up working closely with elected uh, leaders who had gone into exile uh, and set out to make the case uh, to governments around the world for international support and the application of international pressure on the military junta of Myanmar. And I think it's interesting to note that the reforms that were overturned in an illegal military coup last year were those that had been made possible by international action and pressure back then. And that is an important lesson for us as we confront the devastating impact of last year's military coup, the nightmare that followed for the people of Myanmar, and the failure, quite frankly, of the world to take the kind of action that I believe can make a difference. What is needed first is for the world to pay attention to what is going on in Myanmar. And that is why I am particularly grateful that you're putting a spotlight of attention on this crisis uh, this evening. As I reported to the members, uh, member states of the United Nations Human Rights Council and General Assembly, conditions in Myanmar have gone from bad to worse to horrific since the military coup of February of last year. The junta has killed more than 2,300 civilians, arrested more than 16,000, and displaced more than 1 million people. They have attacked entire villages and burned more than 28,000 civilian homes to the ground. In July, they executed four political prisoners, including a former parliamentarian and a prominent pro-democracy activist. 84 political prisoners remain on death row and are at risk of imminent execution. They have tortured untold numbers of detainees, including at least 142 children. At least 61 children have been held hostage by the junta as a means of compelling their parents who are in the opposition to give themselves up. 150,000 Rohingya remain confined in de facto internment camps in Rakhine State. Experts warn of a looming food crisis and a dramatic increase in child malnutrition. It has been projected that more than 30,000 Myanmar children will die preventable deaths this year because they did not have an, ha access to uh, and receive routine immunizations. Women are losing the economic and social gains that they tenaciously fought for over the last decade. Last week, I had the opportunity to meet with leaders of Myanmar's indigenous communities and environmental advocates from Myanmar on the eve of what is known as COP27, or the UN Conference on Climate Change that is underway right now uh, in Egypt. Myanmar is home to some of the largest areas of rainforest, mangroves, and the most biologically diverse ecosystems in Southeast Asia. It is from where 90% of the world's jade flows, rare earth minerals power smartphones, antique lines luxury ships. The junta is destroying the environment with unchecked, unfettered exploitation of Myanmar's natural resources through extractive enterprises that they own or control so that they can line their pockets and those of their cronies while funding their military machine. I am known as a special rapporteur, or in UN speak, I am the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar. Special rapporteurs are part of what is known as uh, special procedures of division of the United Nations. And the idea is to bring to the UN independent perspectives and expertise on important geopolitical issues and developments. My job as SR, as we call ourselves, is to present an independent perspective or picture of human rights developments in Myanmar, an analysis of those developments and recommendations of what I think should be done about them. In other words, I am in 
but not of the United Nations. I am part of the UN system, but I am also independent of it. I do not answer to the Secretary General or the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, so I am in a position to say what might not otherwise be easily said, but I'm also required to communicate within certain parameters. I cannot, for example, criticize a government by name unless and until I notify that government about what I am about to say and provide them with an opportunity to prepare a response. Those are part of my ground rules and those could impact perhaps the discussion that we'll have later in our, our program. I'll, I'll let you know. But that's those are the ground rules, or at least some of the ground rules uh, in which uh, I function as special tool. When my team and I were researching what UN member states are providing, what UN member states are providing, what weapons to the junta, for example, and how they're being used uh, on attacks on civilians. I provided each government my findings and exactly what I was about to say about them in my report. I categorized the arms transfers that each government had made or authorized based not only on the types of weapons transferred and what they were doing to the people of Myanmar, but also when they were delivered to the junta. My first category included those who provided the types of weapons were, that are known to be used to kill civilians and that were delivered after the coup, that is after February of last year. There were three nations who fell into this category. And the reason I had that category was because it was very, very clear uh, that weapons that were going to flow into Myanmar after the coup, given the response of the coup to the nationwide opposition uh, and, 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 and demonstrations that were occurring all around the country and the brutal response of the junta to that uh, to those uh, those demonstrations it was very clear that those weapons could and probably would be used against civilians and indeed they were uh, there were three nations in that number one category Russia China uh, no surprise probably and Serbia now the Serbian ambassador called me, on my cell phone within a day of when I sent my findings to him uh, to protest Serbia's designation in my report. And, they, and he told me very strongly that the information that I had in my report uh, was incorrect. So I held up a release, the release of the report until we checked, double checked and triple checked the information. And when we did so, we actually found more information about additional weapons that were flowing from Serbia into Myanmar. Now, the ambassador attacked the report and me uh, during uh, a session of the UN Human Rights Council, claiming that the report was based on speculation and not fact. I respectfully told member states that the source of the facts, which I reported, were the documents that authorized the weapons transfers, and those documents were signed by Serbian government officials. To their credit, the Serbian government has subsequently announced that they will not authorize any future arms sales to the Myanmar military junta. I brief the UN Human Rights Council at each of its sessions, or three times per year. I submit an extensive written report to the council each spring. And in the fall, I submit a comprehensive written report and make an oral presentation to the members of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, which I did just two weeks ago. But I found that given the crisis in Myanmar, this is just not enough. So I've begun a series of special in-depth report called in the lexicon of the United Nations conference room papers. The first report were, was what I just referred to, the uh, report on weapon sales uh, to the junta. In June, I released a report on the impact that the crisis is having on Myanmar's children. And next month, I will deliver uh, and release a report on how the junta seeks and how governments intentionally or inadvertently provide the means for the junta to try and project a veneer of legitimacy to the world. I will continue to focus on the issue of legitimacy as the junta prepares to orchestrate an event next year that it hopes the world will recognize as an election. Now, ominously, some governments have indicated a willingness to provide election assistance to the junta. And in my view, this would be inexcusable. I've done a lot of work, as you heard, 
uh, in the in my introduction around the world on with governments, with political parties, with civil society organizations who are all engaged in elections. And I can tell you, you cannot have an election when you arrest, torture, and execute your opposition. You cannot have an election when there is no free press and when it is a crime to criticize the military junta that is now holding 54 million people hostage. The junta needs three things to survive. It needs money, it needs weapons, and it needs legitimacy. And the international community can play a critically important role in facilitating or denying all three. And at this juncture, it is clear to me that more can and must be done. Indeed, in my view, the world is failing the people of Myanmar. Now, two weeks ago, when I addressed members of the UN General Assembly about Myanmar, I divided my remarks into three parts, the best, the worst, and the incomprehensible. The best is the remarkable civil society leaders and networks who continue to document human rights violations, provide life-saving aid, and organize nonviolent resistance in Myanmar. I have had the great honor of meeting in just the last several weeks, hundreds of these uh, incredible uh, people. The government, I mean, the, the junta of Myanmar will not allow me into the country, but because of technology, the technology that we're using right now, I'm able to meet with and engage with many, many people throughout, throughout Myanmar. Um, these people are extraordinary. They're human rights defenders, they're journalists, who are risking their lives to document atrocities. They are activists who are organizing in communities large and small. They are lawyers who are risking their lives and careers to represent political prisoners. They are doctors launching mobile clinics. They are teachers who are setting up alternative education systems. These heroes are the best of Myanmar and the best of humanity, and they need and deserve our support. If the junta believe their attacks and atrocities would incapacitate these leaders, organizations, and their networks. They made a very serious miscalculation. The worst of humanity can be found in the ruthlessness of the junta that continues to escalate systematic assaults on the rights and the lives of the people of Myanmar. I told the Human Rights Council when I addressed them in September that each time I briefed them, I had to report that conditions in Myanmar had become even worse than in my previous report. And then indeed, the week before I spoke with them, a junta military gunship descended on a school. Soldiers jumped out and opened fire. More than a dozen were killed in the attack. And I implored the delegates to urge their governments to change course in how they were responding to this crisis, or I could guarantee that I would have even more terrible news to report in my next briefing. Indeed, a few weeks ago, just days before I addressed the UN General Assembly, at least 60 concertgoers were killed in a junta airstrike in Kachin State. Crimes against humanity and war crimes are the stock in trade of the military junta. The junta's ongoing atrocities reflect the worst of humanity. I recently spoke to a group of teenagers when I was doing my, uh, my report on the impact of this crisis on on children and young people. And I asked them about their lives since the coup. And, and the, uh, the, they described uh, terrible, terrible accounts of, of what they and their families had experienced. Um, but I, I decided that I would, I would try to change the focus of the discussion. I said, look, when this is over, and, and eventually this nightmare will be over, what are your hopes? What are your, what are your dreams for, for your future in the new me? My greatest hope, a 14-year-old girl told me, is to have a good night's sleep. She described how she and her family were routinely jarred awake by the sounds of gunfire and shelling, and how she spends each of her nights terrified. A good night's sleep. Part three, the incomprehensible. I think it is fair to say that the people of Myanmar are disappointed in how the world has responded to the crisis there, many who I speak with find it incomprehensible. They understand attention is focused elsewhere, including to Ukraine, for example. And to be clear, those who I speak with support and empathize with the Ukrainian people. 
Indeed, there is a connection. Some of the very types of weapons that are being used to attack the people of Ukraine are being used to attack the people of Myanmar. And they come from the same source, Russia. But while the people of Myanmar support the defense of Ukraine, they have been waiting 18 months for action that it took the United Nations four days to take with respect to Ukraine. Unlike the response to the crisis in Ukraine, with the crisis in Myanmar, there has been no Security Council resolution. There has been no emergency special session of the UN General Assembly. There has been no targeting of the Myanmar military's access to the international banking system. There have been no sanctions against Myanmar financial institutions like the Myanmar Foreign Trade Bank. There has been no freezing of Myanmar central bank assets except by the United States. And there have been no mobilizing of a multi-nation task force to identify, hunt down, and freeze assets of the military junta and its cronies, such as the task force that has been announced with respect to Russia. Meanwhile, as conditions worsen, some of Myanmar's neighbors are detaining or pushing those fleeing the junta's violence back into conflict areas. In the last few weeks, Malaysia has deported more than 100 Myanmar nationals, including some military defectors who are likely to be tortured and face the death penalty. This is outrageous and unacceptable and a violation of international. The fact remains, for the pattern of horror in Myanmar to change, the pattern of the international response must change. Over the past year, I have recommended that a coalition of like-minded nations launch a coordinated initiative to deprive the junta of the weapons, the finances, and the legitimacy that it needs to sustain its attacks, while also increasing humanitarian support to the people of Myanmar. This is because the uncoordinated, non-strategic approach that is now being employed is both inadequate and costing untold numbers of lives. But still, no change in the status of pro approach is underway, nor even under consideration. For the people of Myanmar, this is incomprehensible. What is sorely lacking is a strategic approach where action is targeted on, way, on where the junta is most vulnerable and where it can add up to have the greatest possible impact. Now, ideally, the UN Security Council would consider and pass a resolution that establishes targeted economic sanctions and arms embargo and a referral to the International Criminal Court so that those who are responsible for these crimes can be held fully accountable. But clearly, that is not going to happen because of the certainty of a veto. But this was precisely the case when it came to UN action following the invasion of Ukraine. In fact, coordinated action of nations who supported the people of Ukraine provides a template of what is possible. What is missing in the case of Myanmar is the political will to take such action. The political will for nations to organize themselves into a coalition where their actions are strategic, coordinated, and effective, where they add up to what will have the greatest impact. These actions can include providing a reasonable level of humanitarian aid to an increasingly desperate population. Only a fraction of what is required in Myanmar is being funded, including only 20% of the UN Emergency Response Fund for Myanmar, 20%. Let me conclude by saying what I told the member states of the United Nations General Assembly when I addressed them two weeks ago in New York. The time has come for the world to change course in its response to the crisis in Myanmar. We know what to do. What is required is the political will to do it. Thank you again so very much for the opportunity to join you, and at least virtually, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. That you might have. Thank you. So, th thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'm going to sort of exercise my uh, right of Zoom privilege and ask you a question. And then we do have some some questions ready to go uh, from the audience. So uh, uh, warning up front, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, Speaking of international response to uh, the invasion of Ukraine or the action 
in, in Ukraine, um, people could say, uh, first of all, that um, Ukraine is surrounded by many democratic countries um, and also countries that are acting potentially in their self-interest because uh, they might fear the same um, the same aggression, ultimately. Um, those things probably aren't true with uh, Myanmar. So can, we, the, and the US actually has um, imposed sanctions as, as I think you mentioned on, on Myanmar. Um, so can we, a, a devil's advocate is asking, uh, can we actually expect ASEAN or um, other countries uh, like Russia and China um, and India to act? Uh, the, the Great Decisions article, which I recommend to everybody, talks about a region of durable authoritarianism. So uh, how likely is it? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, the neighborhood uh, around me um, is uh, it's in the interests of those nations who live in this neighborhood to not have a conflagration uh, burning right on their doorstep with 54 million people. The instability, the crisis that that could create, not just within Myanmar, but for the region, we're now just beginning to see as thousands and thousands of people flowing not only uh, into uh, displacement camps within Myanmar, but over the border uh, into the regions of Myanmar. So it is in the interests of the neighbors of of, uh, of Myanmar uh, to, to, take, to take action, uh, to do the right thing. And, and the fact is that, listen, it's a different scenario. Pe I, I had a, an ambassador say, well, you know, this was uh, uh, the people of Myanmar were not invaded by a foreign country. But the fact is those distinctions are lost on the people of Myanmar. This junta um, is acts, has one of the largest militaries in the region and acts precisely as a foreign military power uh, that is uh, uh, wreaking havoc uh, across the country. They are deeply unpopular throughout Myanmar. They are uh, responsible for horrific crimes against humanity and war crimes. And so the distinction between those who are being assaulted by forces that have gone into their country versus those who are being assaulted by forces that originated from their country is lost on those people who are being assaulted. I think there's reason, ample reason for the world to take action that they have yet to take in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now we're going to go to uh, our first question from Heather O'Brien. Um, hi, Heather, go right ahead. Hi, thank you so much, Mr. Andrews. Um, uh, there is no solution to Myanmar without China. And uh, you know all of the the uh, their drive for access to ports, military bases along the um, Andaman Sea, Belt and Road Initiative, minerals, teak, etc. It's that influence is is huge there. Um, how can and the only way that China can be, be influenced in the situation is probably through the U.S. So how is the U.S. able to leverage the ASEAN meeting on November 12th, G20 meeting in Bali thereafter, and then APEC in Bangkok? How can we leverage all those large international meetings to really put the pressure where it's necessary to, to help the Myanmar people? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. And again, I'm I, I get a function of the bounds of my <laughs> of my restrictions with respect to criticizing any particular member member states. But listen, um, everyone has uh, an interest in addressing this crisis, and I can say that uh, that China uh, has uh, expressed uh, some deep concerns about what's what has developed in the country. They had a a very uh, positive relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi and and many in the National League for Democracy and the former, the former government. Um, the current ambassador representing Myanmar uh, in the United Nations, in the General Assembly, um, is the very person who represented the government that the junta uh, uh, attacked uh, and not the junta. They, they, he represents the democratic opposition, um, but he nonetheless has that seat. 
Now, the Credentials Committee is made up of China, the United States, and others. And, uh, and one of the, I think, uh, indications uh, that, uh, that, that China wants to um, uh, see some progress is the fact that that Credentials Committee uh, has, is allowing uh, this vigorous voice of opposition to be the voice uh, for Myanmar in, in, in the General Assembly. You're exactly right. We have some very important summits uh, that are coming up. Um, obviously, China plays an extremely important role in, uh, in the region and certainly with respect to this crisis, but um, both with respect to diplomacy internally and some of the steps that we've seen taken by China externally, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see some progress. It's certainly in the interest of everyone for progress to be made. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go uh, to our next question from uh, Ed Martins. Go right ahead, Ed. Um, thank you, thank you for the talk today. I have a question, I, like in the situation in Ukraine, we have basically, there's just two sides. In Myanmar, there's a whole plethora of organizations fighting the, the government. Some of, some of these ethnic militias there have been fighting them since the beginning of the, that the foundation was then called Burma. Who do we back? Who's who should we be talking to, like on the opposition side there, to the junta? Well, uh, it's a good question, uh, Ed. And I'll tell you, uh, Myanmar is an extraordinarily diverse country made up of many, many uh, ethnic states, well over a hundred uh, eth ethnicities and ethnic states um, that have their own governments, their own, uh, in some cases, militaries, their own power structures, um, and they want, they've been seeking for many, many years now, um, a kind of federation within Myanmar that respects their sovereignty. Um, and so there has been a long history of tension and acrimony, not just with the military junta, but with the, gov the, 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 the government under Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy. What this coup has done, um, and I followed this for many, many years, um, has brought extraordinary cohesion and unity uh, to, to Myanmar, where uh, the people that are engaged, the leaders of these various factions that um, would not talk to each other are engaging directly with each other, uh, are working in coordination with each other, and are recognizing that although the, the glue that, that, that now binds them is their common enemy, they understand that they need to begin to work in a cooperative way together on what the future of Myanmar will look like when this, this crisis is over. I'll tell you, I've had people tell me that they had no idea when, when the, the military junta attacked in 2016 and 2017, the Rohingya ethnic minority in Rakhine State, and committed those, those genocidal attacks, which have now have over, well over 1 million people over the border uh, into Bangladesh. They, they, they told me, frankly, we just didn't believe it. We didn't believe that the military junta was capable of doing such, such things. Now we know that they are. Now we know that we were wrong. And we are uh, uh, willing to, to open our eyes and accept and respect um, those ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya ethnic, uh, ethnic minority that's been so oppressed for so many years. So um, there is a, a great diversity. You're exactly right, Ed. They have, uh, for long periods of history, uh, been uh, not, they, they've not, not only not seen eye to eye, but they've been at each other's throats. But there is remarkable unity that I've seen in the country uh, about not only defeating this, this junta, but building a new man. Great, thank you. Uh, we are going to go to another question, but um, I'm going to drop in with one of my own because we're about, we were just touching on the edges of it. Um, I'm wondering, we were chatting about this before we, we came on the Zoom. I'm wondering if you could say a couple of words for the you know, general audience, of which I am one, um, about the figure of Aung San uh, Suu Kyi. Um, uh, you advocated, I didn't know this before, for her Nobel Prize, uh, which she was awarded in 1991. Uh, how, uh, oh, and, and you may also uh, 
personally be constrained in what you can say, um, but how do you believe that the world is viewing her and how do you believe that she's viewed uh, within Myanmar? What's, what's your impression? Well, she is a, a remarkable um, figure in Myanmar history. Her father was a great hero uh, in, uh, that, that helped to bring about uh, independence for Myanmar. Um, and uh, she has, has just enormous uh, throughout her uh, career, which really began after the 1988 uprising. Um, her career as a political leader has generated a very strong uh, following uh, within, at least within many parts of, uh, of Myanmar. Um, she, as I, as I mentioned, she ran in 1990 with the National League for Democracy. They won the election. The election was not recognized. She went first into detention and then under house arrest for many, many years. Um, we, we then saw that uh, through international pressure, um, a reform occurred in 2008 and elections were held in 2010. And then finally, she was allowed to run in 2015 in which she won a, a very overwhelming victory with her National League democracy and actually took a kind of power. And I say kind of power, because the military junta maintained um, much of the power in the country. They can, can, they can control all the military, they control the borders, they uh, control many of the extractive industries that make them very, very, very wealthy. So they, they had a, a stranglehold over the power, conceding in a deal that would try to provide them with the kind of legitimacy that would lift the sanctions that were being imposed by the world, the kind of reforms that they that they had agreed to that allowed Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD to have a portion of power in, L in, in, in the government. Just to put it, <laughs> a, a fine point on it, just to put it in perspective, the parliament of, of Myanmar at the time, that 25% of the seats in the parliament were not elected. They were appointed by the military junta, so that they were guaranteed seats by the military. So it was not a, a, a real democracy. It was a quasi-democracy. And the idea that was argued by Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD, the glass, is, the glass is half full, work with us, support us, so that it could be uh, even, 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 even more so. We know that when the genocidal attacks occurred in 2016 and 2017, uh, there was uh, an accounting uh, that was brought forward. Uh, there was a charge of, of, of genocide uh, that was brought forward by the, the Gambia, uh, calling those attacks uh, genocidal attacks, um, and 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 asking uh, for the for the court, the, the international court, to to rule that it was indeed a genocide. And what surprised many in the world uh, who had not been following things too closely was the fact that Aung San Suu Kyi herself came uh, to the court um, and argued uh, in defense of Myanmar um, and, and argued that the, that the, uh, the, the jurisprudence, uh, the, the system of justice within the military was more than adequate to provide justice for any problems that might have occurred in those attacks in Rakhine, Rakhine State. That uh, was uh, a, 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 one example of, a, of, a, of an action that um, uh, cost Aung San Suu Kyi support from, from many uh, around the world, contradicted in their view, the fact that she was a Nobel uh, laureate um, and created a kind of mixed picture, mixed view of her in the international community. The fact of the matter is on the first day of the coup, February 1st of last year, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, was arrested. Uh, she was put into detention um, we don't know where she is. We don't know what her condition is. Um, and she, along with the president of the country and thousands and thousands of others, um, remain in detention by this, by this military. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we're going to go to uh, Nazd. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Nazd Alam. Go right ahead. Hi. Hi, uh, Nazd. Yeah, my name is Nazd Alam, and I am actually native of Bangladesh. So I, I am happy to hear a very academic presentation, you know, about Myanmar and uh, global issue. But my question will be very basic question. How we can help 
the people on the ground. And the basic question is uh, uh, 2018 and 2019, I personally went to the Myanmar uh, Bangladeshi camp and spent there two months in 2018 and 2019. And I created a documentary, produced a documentary that Rohingya, that women, atrocity against women. My point is that India or China or the neighboring country are not focusing anything. Bangladesh is an overpopulated, newly independent country. And then over, over a million refugees, I am just surprised that the neighboring country or the UN are not taking an up step to, and I will focus only for the women's side. My documentary is I interviewed 12 women who were raped and they were so brave to give me interview. And I have that documentary. So my point is few things that how the women, and also it is important to mention that these women are Muslim women. And is that something with the, culture, religion, because the international community are not focusing mm. enough because their ethnicity, religious background. Because and of their I, background. Okay, good. Um, sorry. Okay. It's, it's, it's a very, very, very good question. And let me just say that, as I mentioned before. And then I need your help to go further because I did found the foundation is Nazdalam Foundation for Muslim Women Civic Engagement and um, uh, leadership. Okay, Nast, um, strategy. if you okay. if you want to uh, uh, send us an email, uh, we can make sure that um, that goes through to Tom, and okay. uh, maybe you two can be in in touch. Um, yeah. But uh, we can't go really beyond that at this point. So, Tom, go right ahead, please. Bangladesh opened its its borders. Opened the Bangladesh people opened their their hearts to the people of Myanmar to the Rohingya who were escaping from Myanmar uh, during these, these brutal, brutal attacks. And to be perfectly blunt, the government of Bangladesh has not received the kind of support from the international community that is so desperately needed. Uh, in, in support in many, many ways, uh, including basic humanitarian support, support helping uh, with, with third country resettlement of some of these, uh, th these refugees. Uh, working to help conditions in the country, and then also working to address the conditions inside of Myanmar. There are over 600,000 Rohingya remaining in Myanmar right now in Rakhine State. They are living in great fear and in great danger. 150,000 are living in internment camps that are in just horrific conditions. Now, I visited the camps in Bangladesh. I visited these internment camps when I was allowed, still allowed to get into Myanmar. And just to give it some perspective here, there was a, a, a man who I was speaking with at one of these camps uh, who'd been there for, for years. They, they, the camps have been there now. They were supposed to be temporary camps. They've been there for 10 years. They started in 2012. He said to me that if your country, the United States, I was doing some research for the Congress, if your country will not help us in these horrific conditions. And it was just clear what these conditions were. He said, please bomb us. Bomb these camps because it would be better to die than to continue to live in these conditions. So I've been to those camps. I've been to Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh to see the conditions in the camps right now in Bangladesh. I've been to Bashan Shah Island where a number of people have, have been taken. Um, and I can tell you um, there is great need and great injustice that have, has not been addressed with respect to the Rohingya people. And it's incredibly important that the world address this crisis in a way that it has yet to, to, to address it. So it's a very good question and I, and I thank you. Great, thank you very much. All right, now we're going to go to a quick question. We're going to fit in as many as we can. Uh, we're going to go to a quick question from uh, our own colleague, Alex Garcia. Right ahead. 
Yes. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Tom, for being here. Um, my question is regarding specifically what's happening this week with the ACN uh, summit that is going to be taking place over the next couple of days and what your expectations were, um, or rather uh, expectations and hopes for the result for um, this ACN summit, considering that there was the emergency summit that, uh, that did take place uh, over two weeks ago and how that progress may um, shape into this conference. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, Alex, that's a very good question. And again, I'm going to have to strain my uh, uh, the, the parameters of which I'm <laughs> I'm functioning here. And let me say this, you know, as I said in the outcome, the outset, um, the ASEAN countries have a great deal at stake here. This this impacts them more than than most. Um, they uh, established what they call a five point consensus. There was a meeting in April of t- uh, last year after the coup to build a consensus among member states. Um, uh, Min Aung Lang, the head of the junta, was there. He agreed to the consensus. The first point of the five-point consensus was to stop the violence. And he no sooner was the ink not even dry on that document, but he returned to Myanmar and he said, well, those were really suggestions. And uh, I might get to them when stability is restored by my military uh, in, in Myanmar. So he never took it seriously. The, the ASEAN has continued to hold out hope that somehow this five-point consensus can get bring some, some traction. And what frankly gives me some encouragement is that uh, voices within Myanmar, within, within some of the leading nations of ASEAN, I'm sorry, not within Myanmar, within ASEAN, including Malaysia, um, has become critical and be of this five point consensus and this approach saying that it's it's really not going anywhere and that what is required is a recalibration a rethinking and that that a an actual strategy behind an action plan with firm deadlines be established by ASEAN with respect to this to this crisis um, so i was encouraged that there are voices that are being articulated publicly I'm hopeful that that reflects voices that are in discussion as we speak privately uh, within ASEAN, and and hopefully something is going to uh, is going to emerge. What I think is unfortunate are those countries who um, say that they will not act unless ASEAN acts, because ASEAN is where uh, the lead should come from, and and clearly. Uh, ASEAN has a lot at stake here. Clearly, we need to be listening to ASEAN leaders, as as I think many do. But we should not become immobilized because any nation or group of nations is unable or unwilling to act in the midst of this crisis that we have in front of us. So I'm hopeful that we'll see some some progress uh, in the not too distant future from ASEAN. But it would be a good question, Alex. Great. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, Sanjay, our own Roll Boston board member. Sanjay Argarwal, go right ahead. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Tom, this is fascinating discussion. So uh, I guess my maybe I have two part question. One is, what is the issue? Like everything you say makes sense. Yes, we should be acting on it. U.S. and other countries and ASEAN and everybody else. We all seem to know the issue, and it's urgent. As you said, is it a capacity issue, you think, because of everything that's going on in other parts of the world? It's Afghanistan, it's Ethiopia, it's other things. Is that what's stopping everybody from acting? And the second part being, is there a role for others other than governments? Is it business groups that should be doing something? What is the role of other parties who will be affected by who are affected now and will be affected, hopefully positively, if this thing all resolves? Uh, very good question. And <laughs> I wish I knew uh, what the, the major problem is. I, I think part of it has to do with um, just a number of crises that are focusing the attention of the world and, and the Ukraine crisis leads them and, and how much energy and attention that, folk, that, that, that generates by world by world leaders, the the difficulty of this of this issue. There's no question that this this is not going to be a um, an easy thing to move forward. And in light of the fact that the Security Council is not going to take the action that I I would would like it to take, 
The alternative is for countries to take that extra step and actually organize themselves together um, outside of the formal mechanisms of the United Nations, but of course using those mechanisms as a resource um, to coordinate their, their understanding and analysis of the problem, uh, their, their approach to the problem, the common targets that they think are important to, to focus on, and then the implementation of a strategy that can address these, these factors, the, the, the weapons, the, the money, and the legitimacy that the, the military hunter uh, needs. I think part of the answer to your question is that that's difficult to do. Uh, and I've talked to member states and, and, and they tell me, you know, it's difficult to do. We'll be the first to walk in the door of that meeting that you referred to. But we need leadership to call that meeting. Someone's got to call that meeting and someone's got to step forward to do it. And that's and that simply has not been uh, forthcoming. With respect to the private sector, absolutely. Uh, there are a number of things that can happen. And the United Nations has an entire part of its um, a part of its mission uh, to provide businesses with uh, principles, uh, human rights principles, principles of responsibility to conduct their business in a way that respects and advances human rights. And I certainly would refer to those, those, those principles. And one of the things that is, I think, incredibly important is to try and sever the, uh, the, the, the revenue flow that are, that's coming into the coffers of the junta that they're then using to, 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 uh, uh, continue to build its, uh, buy its weapons, build its weaponry, um, and and support its military. The thing about the military is, uh, people I think sometimes forget, it is a very large military. It's one of the largest in the region. Um, and the junta will always tell you that. The problem with that is, is that it's expensive to maintain that kind of uh, uh, military. And so what is a strength is also a vulnerability. And if uh, players in the public and private sectors that are engaged in in uh, any kind of commercial enterprises or finance that are that are involved in flowing money into the coffers of the junta, um, their action is needed, and I think it could make a, a pay strong strong dividends, strong returns by denying the junta that kind of revenue that it desperately needs to maintain its uh, its military. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to uh, try to squeeze in one more question. My friends, we had a bunch of hands up, and then when we uh, went to uh, pull people up, they, they declined, which is um, unfortunate because we love to hear from you. However, uh, my colleague Natalie Mace is going to close us out with a question, and she certainly deserves it. So go right ahead, Natalie. Thanks, Mary. I always appreciate the opportunity to ask questions during our own programs. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Anders, for your remarks. Um, you alluded to and mentioned a report that uh, recently came out in October that you put together, and I had the opportunity to actually go through some of it, um, and it was quite detailed and impressive. Um, particularly with regard to the civil society that's still going strong in Myanmar, despite the challenges. Could you speak a little bit about um, what you hope that report will accomplish and particularly how you were able to put it together given that you are not allowed in the country? <clears throat> that's a very good question, Natalie. Thank you for reading the report. I'm, I'm, I'm just always very happy and impressed when people have actually read these things. You always wonder, you know, are these collecting dust? Are they actually getting some uh, readership? Um, you know, I uh, this was part of, and by the way, let me just tell everyone, if you want to see any of these reports, go to the UN website, go to uh, Special Procedures, and just type in my name, uh, Tom Andrews, UN Special Rapporteur, on the situation of human rights in Myanmar. And then you'll get access, you'll see the reports will all pop up and you can gather any, uh, any of them. And as I say, a, a forthcoming report on legitimacy will be out in the, next few, in the next few weeks. But I did this because of the technology, through the technology that we're using right now. And there's networks of incredible um, uh, civil society organizations, advocacy groups, many of whom I worked with when I was able to go into Myanmar and relationships that I built over many years working with the people of Myanmar. So it's through those relationships and then the extraordinary work that's being done on the ground and then a team of people that uh, is, is involved in, in the work that I'm doing at, at, Yale, at Yale Law School uh, in the Shell Center for International Human Rights 
uh, that have enabled me to be able to compile this in information and contact and reach uh, literally hundreds of people over the last over the last several weeks. So thank goodness for this technology that makes this possible. And thank goodness for people like you who actually read these reports. And there's one coming up in, uh, again in just a few weeks. Great. Uh, well, um, I think now we're, uh, we actually unfortunately are out of time. And uh, now um, I really wanna thank uh, Tom Andrews for just an except, exceptionally informative um, session and um, also all of you participants for exceptionally uh, informed questions. Um, so thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thanks World Boston and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Have a great night. <laughs>